in the final part of this morning's presentation, we're going to go now into the, the clinical case. And you've heard both Rich and David and Lisa and Dr. Taylor all speak about uh, the value of the clinical case. And uh, I want to emphasize again, it's not an exact case. This it was from true records of real case is, plural. But in order to protect the identity of both the agency and the patient, we have modified it <clears throat> to address some of the issues that you will want to talk about throughout the case. Uh, and as we modify, uh, we also try then to protect the identity. So uh, please understand that. But as we get into this section, uh, I'm going to introduce to you uh, someone who I consider a, a dear friend and colleague for as many years as almost I've been uh, with the field. Uh, and that's Dr. Tony Style, Sabato Tony Style in, in your book, as you see. Um, Dr. Style has been uh, with us from um, days that he'll, I'm sure he'll tell you about at St. Francis uh, Medical Center, where he, he was our medical director for substance use treatment, and where today he is with the University of Pittsburgh Western Psychiatric Institute, where he's a number of functions, more in the administrative psychiatric area, but he's also still very close to the, the work of methadone maintenance with uh, Southwest Behavioral uh, uh, Methadone Services and so many other roles that uh, I hope you find them enjoyable. But he'll be facilitating the, the remainder of the conference right up to the question and answers so that uh, we can have a clinical focus. And as you get your questions, don't forget, write them down, that we'll be bringing them up to the panel, and he'll be saying that they get answered later on, if not sooner. So, uh, Dr. Style, please. Again, turn your cell phones to vibrate. I, I did. So, and I have a, 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 an alert at 5 to 12. So we're going to try to end this first hour of the panel around 12 o'clock for lunch. And then around 12.30, Dr. Wartenberg is going to give a keynote uh, address. And then we'll start back uh, with, the, um, with the panel then. Uh, around 1.30. Uh, on the panel right now is Dr. Trisandra Taylor. Um, I first met her when she gave the course at ATOD in uh, methadone, and excellent course. So, A, if you haven't been to ATOD meetings, go to the ATOD meetings. They're every 18 months in different cities and, and rather excellent. And if you haven't, if you do go to the ATOD meetings and you haven't been to Dr. Taylor's and Dr. McNicholas's course, go to that as well because it's quite remarkable. Um, she's currently in Philadelphia and is medical director for JEVS Human Services, which is an OTP. Uh, in Philadelphia. Also up on the panel is Dr. Alan Mortenberg. Now, uh, apparently, uh, uh, this is too short really to introduce you, but uh, he got his BA in, at NYU. Uh, he's originally from Brooklyn, we found out, uh, not too far from where I'm from. Uh, his MD was uh, started at uh, Marquette Medical College, ended at Medical College of Wisconsin, which that was the, the shift that went there. Some of you may remember that in, in Milwaukee. He's currently in private practice, has been previously medical director for Discovery House, and is associate medical director, uh, medical director of the DVA Providence Medical Center, uh, OTP. So I want to welcome him. And of course, you've met uh, Lisa Torres. Uh, and so that will be our panel. And what we we're going to do is uh, take a, uh, an actual case um, and um, go over that case, and uh, I think you have it, but I'll, I'll kind of read it off to you, and if you just bear with me. Uh, this is the case of Mary T. Okay, so th I'm going to read about the first few pages, and then we're going to open the, 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 the panel discussion uh, and, and try to cover you know, both clinical, legal, and, and, and uh, risk management uh, issues uh, in, in this case. Mary T. is a 28-year-old Hispanic female who presented to an opiate treatment program July 13, 2007. Her chief complaint was, I need to get clean, I'm tired, I'm run down, I don't want to be a drug addict for the rest of my life because I need a window or elsewhere on how the patient responded to these increases. Uh, you know, it certainly is, is another major red flag. And, you know, Tom Paint has a lot of slides I mean, it was, it's the most important slide I've ever, that I've ever looked at is the one that says, remember the steady state. Um, 
you know, you can see one of the difficulties. I've reviewed a legal case recently where a patient, all patients were initially given 30 milligrams, and ver and all were given an additional 10 if they sh still showed withdrawal. The patient was assessed 20 minutes after the initial dose in a drug that takes two to four hours to be absorbed. So, you know, again, I think a, a basic lack of understanding of the pharmacology of the drug, a lack of training of the appropriate personnel to be able to know this and to recognize it, you know, play a role in, in this. I would just uh, sort of echo um, Dr. Taylor's comments about not really having enough information. But the red flags that would go up for me, um, looking from uh, a, a legal perspective, would be uh, the absolute failure of um, individualized care documentation. You know, you have this sort of standing uh, order. And um, the fact that her uh, urinalysis came up uh, negative for opioids, I would find um, a troubling. It, it would just warrant further, um, further action. And what you're looking for is, is whether or not this is someone who's appropriate for methadone. And this is where your consent, um, even at this stage, um, especially regarding options, um, would come, come into effect even though she's actually she's claiming not to be in withdrawal or mild withdrawal, um, and and what that means to her uh, is important to interpret. So, okay, Dr. Taylor, did you want to comment on the uh, on the cows? Well, that's the point. Um, moving on to the next slide, if we go back to the information that was presented, um, I would score her somewhere around five. And you can see that's in the mild range. Um, how many people are familiar with the cows? Clinical opiate withdrawal scale. Well, it is a useful tool um, that is used. I want to draw your attention to the article that's mentioned there, the Journal of Psychoactive Drugs in 2003. It's an excellent article by Don uh, Wesson and Walter Lane. It gives you some of the history and so forth. So see if you can't dig that up. Now, the preliminary treatment plan, the physician statement for documentation of current physiological dependence upon opioids was completed and signed. The patient was recommended for admission to opioid maintenance treatment because of her lack of uh, minimal family and community support, which places her at high risk for relapse. Well, my concern here is we have a, well, again, getting back to this case, this patient, you can see, was admitted. So, at some point, there was a preliminary treatment plan, which is a requirement for all patients. But I'm still uncertain how the patient meant that and what the content of this plan was. We didn't have that in the information that was provided, so we sort of left that out in the scenario. But again, I don't, in my opinion, have enough information to even establish a diagnosis. So how can you have a plan if you don't have a diagnosis? or the diagnosis that is required to be admitted to an opioid treatment plan program. Well, I, and, I, and one of the things about th these cases is that when we pull them together, uh, we pulled the information that we had. So this information, enough information to, to uh, uh, accord an appropriate diagnosis, be, being missing from uh, the uh, chart is, you know, it, it's pretty uh, compelling. It leaves a hole, a, hole, a vulnerability for um, trouble down the line. And um, that's the thing. Um, you know, when I was somewhat more in the trenches, I'm still involved clinically at, uh, at the VA, but when I was the medical director at the Rhode Island. Discovery House programs, which had about 700 patients, and uh, I spent a lot of time with people, uh, uh, both training and seeing patients, uh, making these kinds of decisions. You know, what I wanted to hear, what I told our staff, is that if I didn't hear a few times, at least a few times during the year, and ideally every three or four months, there should be somebody we're not taking. 
that, uh, that there are people for whom we are not appropriate. And that if you do good informed consent, I mean, you know, I, I once really scared Mark Perino at a, 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 on a dais where I got up and said, I wish there wasn't a single methadone program in the world. Because what I would like to see are chemical dependency programs that include all the arms that you need to treat people, including methadone. The difficulty we have is, you know, we are the proverbial hammer, and that patient who comes in is the nail. And, you know, we are going to put that nail into that piece of wood. You know, and, and this, you know, there's a concept of no wrong doors. Um, you know, we're not necessarily always a wrong door, but we often are. And, you know, but we're in a field, you know, we talk about having an evidence base. We don't have an evidence base as to which patient is right for which treatment. If you are the same opiate, if Mary T. walked into a therapeutic community, she'd be admitted into the therapeutic community. If she walked into a doc who does buprenorphine, she'd be put on buprenorphine. If she walked into a five-day detox that then does drug-free, that's what she'd get, because that's what they have. And wouldn't it be nice if we had programs that where you could actually do a unitary assessment and say, look, on the basis of the best information I have, which is, has nothing to do with randomized controlled trials of which patient is proper for which treatments, based on our own gut instincts and things like how much support, what the patient wants, you know, what they're able to afford, what's available, I mean, all of those things play a role. But that would be nice, but we don't have that here. So she walks into a methadone program and not surprisingly gets admitted. Again, I would not have as much concern about admitting her. She was in very, very mild withdrawal when she came in. 20 milligrams. Don't change it. Yeah, I mean, so I think that would have avoided uh, a lot of adversity if somebody had just said, look, she's a week out of her last use. It's been as bad as it's going to get three days ago. And, you know, we're seeing very, very little. So if we need to raise it to blocking doses because she's continuing to use, well, we'll do that. You know, but right now, the having her on, you know, if you're going to admit her, and I agree that concerns could be raised as to whether getting her into some kind of drug-free program, putting her on naltrexone. But again, we don't have that in methadone programs. What we have is having, we have a patient there, we know if we send them somewhere else, a certain number of them are going to disappear. So, you know, we have the patient in front of us. We have an opportunity to make a difference. I don't mean that's a wrong thing necessarily to do, but it needs to be done in more coherent ways than we've been used to doing. Let's talk about the dosing then. We'll move on. Uh, Mary T. Segment 2 dosing titration schedule. Her dosing schedule were per standing orders. Day 1, uh, 30 milligrams, day two, 40 milligrams, day three, 50 milligrams. Day four, which happened to be a Sunday and this was in a take home, 60 milligrams. On Monday, uh, she came in again and was given 65 milligrams. And on Tuesday, there was a no show. Dr. Taylor? Yes, as we can see, Mary was admitted and here was the standing order protocol. Uh, I do want to go back briefly to the point that I agree, Alan, that um, at some point, alternatives should have been more aggressively entertained for this patient. This patient could, might have been appropriate for a referral to an outpatient or an inpatient um, approach in terms of um, what we call, I hate the word, drug-free. Um, I like maintenance-free um, or treatment that is not what we call medication-assisted. Um, but nonetheless, they did start her. And I support that if I lean towards saying that, well, I feel there is a diagnosis here and I have an, enough uh, to admit this patient, I would not have started her on 30 milligrams. My range would have been somewhere between 10 and 20 with very careful observation of this patient, not the typical um, get your dose, see you tomorrow. It would have been some alternative measure to follow up with this patient um, or keep the patient in the clinic for several hours to observe her because, again, I'm very concerned with a negative urine and a history that is unusual. So that would be my approach. I'd be concerned about this question of her mental stability 
And at some point, I would want to have a psychiatric assessment. Maybe not urgently, but she didn't seem to be stable in that sense. So um, I would recognize that. Um, but we'll talk more about the standing order protocols. Uh, actually, do you want to talk about the dear uh, colleague letter? Are you OK. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, there's been some guidance from CSAT, and I don't know if you're familiar with the um, website in terms of where the dear colleague letters are. I believe, when is it? It was in um, oh, yeah. September of 2009. There was a dear colleague letter that went out to programs. And basically what this led to focus was around the issue of advising or providing guidance to programs and physicians about caution with standing orders. And this was based upon um, information that they had gathered over a course of time from OTP inspections. Um, Jane Maxwell published a paper in 2005 that really talked about the knowledge base of, in particular, physicians about the first dose of methadone and their understanding of their awareness of the risk of death during induction. And it was quite revealing that there needed to be some further um, educational um, activity. But basically, this letter stated that there was responsibility on the physician's part to individualize um, a patient's dose, to be knowledgeable about the pharmacology, specifically the pharmacokinetics and the pharmodynamics of methadone. Um, so if you haven't read that letter, I would go back and read it, or if you're not knowledgeable about the Dear Colleague letter. Okay. Uh, day one, Mary was started on a dose of 30 milligrams of methadone with a standing order to increase 5 to 10 milligrams daily up to a maximum of 80 milligrams. There were no symptom indications to guide the dose increases. That was day one. And she received the 30 milligrams. On day two, she re received a dose of 40 milligrams. And uh, Dr. Taylor, I think, was going to comment on the pharmacology of methadone. Uh, well, we'll come to that um, subsequently. But okay. again, if you look at this, um, what, what you call protocol, um, to me, it ignores the science of the pharmacology. Um, what we're talking about here, I can't see the monitor, <laughs> so I'm reading from here. Um, when you, when we're, what, what I'm talking about in terms of pharmacokinetics, you're talking about how the body handles a drug. The absorption, the distribution, metabolism, elimination of the drug. Okay? Now, methadone has a long plasma, just a brief bullet here. Uh, there's an excellent reference in your handout on the pharmacology of methadone, um, the clinical aspects, etc., and I'd refer you to that. But at any rate, it has a long elimination uh, plasma half-life. There are problems of drug-drug interactions, um, and there's individual variation based on a person's genetics. And special populations, such as pregnant women, have different kinetics. Now, when you talk about the pharmacodynamics, we're talking about the effect of the drug on the body, how the, body, how the patient responds, what their tolerance is. We are all should be aware that there's what we call a peak respiratory effect, there are cardiac induction effects, and a CNS uh, depressant effect related to opioids and, and other drug interactions. And there's also individual variation in, in that. There's a mantra that we use, um, start low and go slow. And basically, this um, means you start at a low dose and you go slow. You don't start orders 30, 40, 50, 60, because we'll see later on that ignores this pharmacology. The patient must be educated about this, and the, pra and the practitioner, meaning the physician, the nurses, anyone involved should have a thorough understanding of this. So that's just the bullet um, in terms of pharmacology of methadone. 
If you haven't read the package insert, you really ought to read the package insert for methadone. Um, because all of this information is in that package in insert. I wanted to say something about um, the legal standards for uh, something like a letter from uh, a dear colleague letter. Um, when we're uh, looking at um, negligence or malpractice, we're looking at a duty and then a duty to uphold a certain standard of care. And that standard of care um, is determined first by actual standards, then by guidelines, and then um, I guess under that would be um, publications and so-and-so. Uh, -so. The, the Dear Colleague letter isn't law, but it establishes a standard, or at least raises the standard, and um, it gives uh, a new uh, level of um, knowledge. Um, by publishing this letter, you, you're in the field, you should have a new lev um, level of knowledge that um, individualized care is absolutely critical during this period. And I also want to say, I'm thinking, with what we know and how, I mean, all of the factors that go into determining appropriate dose, that first dose and keeping patient safety, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, all of the, the the individualized decisions that have to be made, I would say it's almost or very closely to per se negligence to use standing orders and to start with uh, a one particular dose for all patients. I mean, that, that really, in this day and age, that, that's going to get you into trouble. So, those are my own. Uh, just to, you know, to make one point that this isn't black or white, I mean, there are patients where somebody was on 130 milligrams of methadone, walked off the program, got kicked off the program, they're gone for three weeks. You know what that patient's tolerance is, and you know what they can tolerate. So, um, you know, I think that there are cases where starting at higher doses and more rapidly increasing uh, is appropriate. And if, in fact, if you don't do that, you're going to lose that patient. Uh, so it's not that, you know, never say always, never say never it, it, it kind of issue. There are times, but again, it's an individual determination looking at the patient. And I'd also like to say, I mean, they, you know, I, I have known West Clark for a very, very long time. A lot of people, including many in ATOD, have had concerns about these dear colleague letters as being a substitute for regulation that, um, you know, the issue, you know, for example, some of the very, in my view, disingenuous suggestions, uh, you know, the DEA does not allow emergency rooms to dispense methadone uh, in the kind of ways that this would be called for. It's not an emergency circumstance. They're not, uh, they are already in a program, and the only time that, you know, if you look at the DEA regs themselves, the kinds of things they're saying you need to do um, to make sure that everybody doesn't get a take-home in a program that's closed on Sunday are not possible. And they're, they're also costly. They're, I mean, they're, uh, so we, we're put in very, very difficult positions as clinicians. It's really no-win situations where the rules allow us, if we're in a program that's closed on, on Sunday, to give take-homes without regard to the eight-point criteria. Uh, but then saying, well, if somebody gets into trouble with that take home, you're responsible. Um, you know, those, those, are, those are difficult circumstances. We'll come back to that later Can in this I case. Add, I just wanted to, to add um, a point about um, the um, legal validity of these dear col colleague letters. There was concern that this is, in fact, an attempt to circumvent the legal process, and um, it's not, you know, the, the legality of that um, became an issue. And the Legal Action Center actually produced a very, um, very sharp um, memorandum on the issue of whether or not it was legal. These um, uh, dear colleague letters had any validity or legality. And um, they they concluded that it, it's it's absolutely not legal. It's 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 trying to circumvent a process that's there for our protection and um, that 
um, to be careful. It, what it does, it does, you have to admit, it does get, it, it circulates knowledge, that even knowledge of a controversy is knowledge, it, the little red flag should go off. Well, I, I just want to add, and, and we do have CSET in the room, and perhaps maybe during the um, luncheon uh, we can have a little more formal discussion. You know, my take on the Dear Colleague letters is that this is guidance that is coming from CSET, and I don't think, and I could be wrong, that it was intent to be a law or so forth, but I take it as very serious information that is guidance and advice to programs to really look and examine what you're doing and see are you consistent with this in terms of your practice. So again, it's guidance. Okay. Uh, we've had mention of the steady state previously, Dr. Pate's uh, uh, Steady state roadmap. So, would you want to comment on that, sir? Well, a picture is worth a thousand words, and this is what I believe perhaps Alan would like to comment on this. I don't have a problem. I know this slide very well. We use it in the course. I actually have it in all both programs where I work on the wall, and I go over it with patients during induction. I, I personally just like to draw the pictures for patients. Yeah. But, you know, again, if you look at it in a simplistic way, you give somebody 30 milligrams of methadone and assume a 24-hour half-life, 15 milligrams of that methadone is left, you're giving them another 30. So the next day, 45 is on board, 22 and a half of that. I mean, again, those numbers aren't accurate. And there are people with half-lives of methadone of 100 hours, and there are people with half-lives of 8 hours. So, uh, you know, it, we... Fortunately, opiates give us enough of a handle in looking at somebody that you can get some picture of it, but you've got to look at them and know what you're looking for. And you know, this is also one of the weaknesses that I see in the medical legal work I do, is that you know, nurses are giving these increases. It says it may be increased at nursing discretion. The patient's telling the nurse, I'm still feeling withdrawal at night. Um, and there's no physical assessment that you necessarily can do that is going to you know, give you the information you need. But you know, I think uh, uh, Dr. Taylor mentioned one of the things we, we don't do enough of in programs uh, are peak assessments, seeing somebody four hours out. And again, there are difficulties with that. There's some programs people have to drive you know, for three hours to get there. They've got a job. They've got child care stuff. And these are not trivial issues. But I think that you know, if we present to people up front that, look, in order for you to, you know, for us to know where you're at, we really need to see you not only at your trough level, which is when you're walking in in the morning, but four hours later, when we see some idea of what you're like at your peak levels. Uh, and that if you want to get optimal treatment, that that's what you need to do. And if you can't do it, then we're going to have to be more conservative because we're not going to be able to know where you're at on a peak level. And as we all know, this is a population, you know, what I always explain to my patients when on day one is that we're not here to do with our drug what you were doing with your drug. That, you know, these are folks who have so much pain and so much trauma in their lives that many of them are really trying to dissociate from it with, with opiates, with benzodiazepines, with other drugs. And they're trying to reach, uh, you know, something that is close to unconsciousness. And that's not my goal. So, you know, we, they will be telling us, even if they're feeling sedated at night often, that, oh, I'm not on enough, I'm still feeling sick. And if we keep increasing the dose, we can have disastrous consequences. Right. And, you know, I just want to take a few moments to get on my soapbox, so to speak, because I see too much of a, what I call a gas and go mentality. And we have to take this medication very seriously. It's, you know, patients want to come in and go, so go. You have to take time for assessment because the consequences can be very dangerous. So we all have to work hard, and you're going to hear an excellent lunchtime discussion about this, about changing some of the culture in programs. But I call it, you know, guess and go.
throws money up. And we have to reverse some of that. Thank you. A couple uh, of things that I really have taken away from this roadmap is number one, without increasing the dose on a daily basis, mm -hmm. the peak levels increase automatically over time. And that's something we have to remember. I, I'm, I'm on a committee in Pennsylvania looking at methadone safety, both in, in OTPs but also in pain management programs. And uh, the recommendations that have come down from some of the pain management uh, experts uh, in regards to, to methadone is two and a half milligrams twice a day as a starting dose with strong warnings to the patient not to take extra because of the because of the accumulation and letting them know that the two and a half milligrams twice a day may not in fact handle their pain immediately but do not alter the dose without checking with me first and then it goes up in a very very slow way so they do start low go slow and uh, uh, I won't tell you where this was but uh, uh, an elderly man came in on uh, uh, basically morphine for pain, uh, was not abusing it, was on it legitimately, and uh, uh, the one of the house staff at where I was, I won't say where I was, uh, decided that he was going to switch him over to a, a better medication, methadone, uh, longer acting, didn't have to take it as often, etc. And he read, of course, in the P PDR, right, the PDR, the the conversion, which. By the way, don't read it. If you do read it, don't believe it, okay? And he somehow or another decided to start this elderly man on 30 milligrams three times a day of methadone. And fortunately, thank God, the nurse came in after the first dose, saw the guy was blue, called the code, gave him some Narcan, and he eventually uh, was, was uh, resuscitated. So uh, most physicians, as, as I see them, no, do not know that methadone is an outlier. It's not just another opiate. It's a total outlier, and particularly because of this roadmap. Okay, this is not a roadmap for morphine or Dilaudid or, or heroin. It's is a roadmap for methadone. And it is a very, very different medication. So start low and obviously go slow. Um, now we're going to go to, ah, and we're, we're going to not finish her in the morning. We're going to probably finish her Mary T in the afternoon and then do the, Trasads and the uh, yeah. No, it, well, it's up to you. Yeah, we have we have an hour and you want fifteen to do minutes uh, for yeah, Mary T for your case on Trasads and uh, on take home. Yeah. So Trusades. and then and then and then yeah. So we're, yeah. We're, we're 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 doing okay so far so good as the man said that fell out the window. You know. so. <laughs> okay. Um, and my alarm will go off soon and then I'll know what to do. Okay, Mary reported to the dispensing nurse. This is on day three, by the way. Her day three dose was, was then 50 milligrams. She was experiencing withdrawal symptoms, okay, and asked to see the nurse practitioner. The dispensing nurse advised Mary that her dose was to be increased and administered 50 milligrams of methadone according to the standing order protocol. She also gave Mary her Sunday take-home methadone, 60 milligrams dose, for day four, as the clinic was closed on Sundays. And per regulations, uh, the clinic customarily gave all patients Sunday take-home medications. Now, I don't know, is it all of Pennsylvania or just most of Pennsylvania that no longer is closed on Sundays? The majority of programs in Pennsylvania open seven days a week. Right. That was a recommendation from the Division of Program Licensure. It wasn't a requirement, but almost everybody's gone along with it. Yeah, so they were encouraged. So, um, and let's see here. Okay, do you want to uh, have any comments on Mary T. Uh, Lisa or Dr. Wartenberg? This is going to sort of lead into what I'm going to talk about at lunch. But I mean, it's again sort of with these dear colleague letters issues. In, and, and opening seven days a week is what I don't see happening with this is the funding of these unfunded mandates that, you know, we're doing business on the cheap and there's a limit to what we can do on it and at some point, you know, we, we need to rise up in righteous indignation and say that 
you know, we got to get paid for what we do. We, you know, I mean, if it's a not-for-profit program, that doesn't mean it's not supposed to make money. Um, it, you know, it, we have to be fiscally responsible. We have to pay our staff. We have to have, uh, you know, adequate treatment for our patients, whether it's a not-for-profit or a for-profit program. Uh, and we're, this is the difficulty, is that we're being pushed by all ends. We're being pushed by the government from the top, we're being pushed by state regulators and, uh, and by newspapers and by HarmD and by others. We're being exhorted appropriately by our patients mm -hmm. and by patient advocacy groups to do the right thing by them. But none of this is going to happen. I mean, money's not the only thing it needs. I'm talking, I mean, imagination and, uh, and a little courage and uh, and, and some intellect and some effort uh, in, in the time we have, but it isn't going to happen without more money. I mean, we're, you know, Rhode Island programs uh, charge $80 a week. I mean, you know, I see a social worker uh, as a family therapist with some stuff we're working on, you know, I pay her twice that uh, for, for our sessions. I mean, what can you get for $80 a week? Uh, you know, we're, we're providing uh, the methadone, we're providing nurses, we're providing doctors, we're providing counselors, we're providing the building, the security, the insurance, and all that for $80 a week. You know, there's no way to do that and do good work when push comes to shove. I'm going to uh, table that till later for the lunch discussion uh, because um, you have some valid points, but I want to take play devil's advocate in terms of uh, from a business perspective. But in getting back to the case, my concern here is that, look, at day, on day three, Mary had symptoms. I'm concerned about that. She requested evaluation, and we need to look at, well, what happened? She asked to be seen by the nurse practitioner. And what did the dispensing nurse do? Accordingly, the dispensing nurse gave her the protocol rather than follow through. What procedures do you have in your program when a patient presents to the window complaining? Yes, I understand the doctors are not there at 24-7 or whatnot or when the hours the clinic is open. What does the nurse do? Does she call the physician or someone to say, I have a problem. What would you like me to do? So I'm concerned that she had symptoms and it doesn't appear that her symptoms were addressed in my opinion appropriately. Further, she requested evaluation and, you know, that was not managed. So those are two concerns that I have on day three. And then, uh, did you want to comment on the CSAP guidance uh, for take-homes? We're going to do that later. Okay, so we'll wait on that.